It's great to see everybody here tonight for this wonderfully titled event, Men Behaving Badly. Let's hope they don't do it right here. Um, my name is Liz Howell, and I'm a professor of television journalism at City and a former TV journalist. Years ago, I was asked if I'd ever suffered from sexism in my career, and I said, oh, no, not me. Well, what an idiot, actually. From being groped to being put down to being sacked, yes, me too. Okay, that's enough about me. What do you think of me, as Bette Midler once famously said? But no, seriously, moving on, our event does have the brilliant title of Men Behaving Badly. It's ir ironic to remember that this was actually the title of a very popular comedy show watched by millions of people on ITV from 1992. And I looked up the blurb for the programme and it said, A comedy. Two early 30s friends live together while having completely different personalities. While their girlfriends try to help them take on more responsibility, the boys seldom respond and usually end up drinking together. Well, ha, bloody ha, as my mother would have said. You know, boys will be boys and girls will be goody goodies. And it's actually very difficult to object to a comedy show without sounding like a wet blanket. And it was funny. We did laugh. But the indulgence of men behaving badly is a pervasive attitude. And I'm, for, for one, I'm sure it underpins the really bad behavior we've heard about lately. Behavior that is deeply damaging to women and not a joke at all. And it goes on just when men thought it was safe to go back in the locker room. Even recently, we've had the latest Oxfam scandal and now the Cambridge Analytica scandal with girls allegedly used as honey traps by this major data company. The treatment of these scandals and the part played by the new active role of women in exposing them and facing humiliation, discrimination, and even simple everyday banter, horrible word, in the process is what we're here to discuss tonight. One cautionary word, we do have members of the press here tonight, and this is a public forum, so do make sure that you say what you want to say, and you say things you'd be quite happy to read in the morning. <laughs> Let me start by introducing our panel. Madison Marriage is a reporter for the Financial Times. She joined the Financial Times from Incisive Media, where she worked on two investment magazines, Hedge Funds Review and Investment Europe. Miss Marriage is a graduate from Oxford in French and German, and she's most well known for being the undercover reporter at the infamous President's Club dinner on January the 18th this year. Heather Brook, sitting next to Madison, is a British-American journalist and a Freedom of Information campaigner. After an internship with the Spokesman Review in Olympia, Washington, she had a brief to cover the state legislature, and this gave her early exposure to using public records requests to investigate the expenses of politicians. She helped to expose the 2009 MPs expenses scandal, which culminated in the resignation of House of Commons Speaker Michael Martin. Heather is a professor of journalism at City University London, here in the Department of Journalism. She's the author of three books, Your Right to Know, The Silent State, and The Revolution Will Be Digitized. Then on my far left, we have Chris Greer, Chris is the Dean of the School of Arts and Social Sciences here at City University. He's a professor of criminology, and his teaching interests are in the broad areas of crime, media and criminal justice, sociology of media and communication, victimology, punishment and penalty, and criminology theory. Chris recently presented a BBC Radio 4 programme in the archive series called The Scandal Machine, which traced the evolution of scandals involving high-profile public figures and how the media reported them. So can we have applause for our panellists? <laughs> I'm going to start with Madison and ask the question I'm sure we are all wanting the answer to. Why did you do it and what was it like? <laughs> um, it was unpleasant in a nutshell, but... Um, I don't know, I'm assuming not everyone will have uh, read the reporting. So uh, the President's Club is a 33-year-old charitable trust um, which hosts a dinner every January uh, for men only. And those men tend to be high-profile um, uh, kind of celebrities of the business world from every sector under the sun. Um, very few people actually knew about this club. So um, I was tipped off to it by a friend who um, occasionally does hostessing work, so it's a hospitality job, um, often in kind of sports stadiums, Twickenham, Wimbledon, um, where you serve drinks and show people to their seat. Um, it's not meant to be scandalous at all. Um, she was, she knew about the President's Club dinner 
which was held every January, um, from other hostesses who had also worked at this event, and she was being told uh, time and time again, do not work at this event, it's disgusting. Um, and given the current climate, she thought it might be worth flagging it to me because um, she knows I write about business and um, that a lot of high profile business people tend to go to this. Um, so she first tipped me off about it in November, which triggered the kind of internal machinations of do we or don't we do this story. Um, uh, eventually I managed to get myself hired as a hostess and uh, yeah, the night itself was um, pretty uh, grotesque is how I describe it. Can you be a bit more graphic? Because I think we do want to know. You know, when you say, so you, you, were, you were lined up and paraded around. I mean, I think we've read that. Yeah, so the, well, the evening, we were there for four hours before the evening formally kicked off at 8 p.m. Four hours before it started? I got there at 4 p.m. Um, that's what time, so my shift was officially 4 p.m. till 2 a.m. Um, that was broken up into three segments. So there's the preparation, the dress rehearsal, um, the uh, buffet dinner, um, and then at 8 p.m., all the women, so there was 130 women to about 360 men, um, and the women were told to enter the ballroom of the Dorchester via a stage positioned in the front of the room, coming from opposite sides of the stage and kind of crisscrossing lines one by one while they blasted um, power by Little Mix across the room. Um, kind of ironic title in hindsight. Um, they, we were then all kind of distributed to different tables, so about three women per table of 10 men. Um, and I'll be honest, when I first, uh, when the evening began, I thought maybe I've got this horribly wrong, <laughs> that some of the men were very polite, some of them were actually slightly appalled by what they were seeing and thought that the whole thing seemed quite back, backwards, old fashioned. Um, I think I put this in the report, but one man saying, you know, crikey, is this 1975? Um, so no, at first it wasn't that bad, but the, the, the worst part of the evening was uh, the after party, which began at midnight and finished at two. Um, and all of, most of the hostesses were mandated to work until 2 a.m., but from midnight till two, there was no official role. So there was no longer tables to be served or drinks to be poured. Um, in my opinion, they were solely there to be decorative and worse. Mm -hmm. And you were actually asked to go on working till two o'clock because there was an implication you to, yeah. that you could get away at the end of the dinner if you wanted to. There, there was a small number of women who I think uh, knew what they might be in for because they've worked at the event previously who um, left at midnight. I think they probably pled in advance, you know, I've got to get the last train home mm. or something. Um, but the vast majority of the hostesses were there till two. Um, and, you know, I've been told you must be there till two. That's, that's your contract. That's what you're there to do. Yeah. Were you surprised by the reaction to your report? Yes. Um, I, thought it would, uh, I thought it would do well. Uh, I had no idea that it would break the FT's record for most read story ever. And um, uh, I think we've got an internal metric where you can see where it's being read. And uh, a, a colleague told me that the only country it hasn't been read in the world is uh, North Korea. Mm. So it definitely... <laughs> Um, is there, is there any point at which you think the reaction's been disproportionate to what, disproportionate to what you actually saw? That's a good question. Um, no, I think people are rightly, uh, genuinely shocked that this kind of thing is still happening with the people who are making the decisions about how this country is run, from the politicians to the business leaders. Uh, these are important people, and many of them were behaving disgracefully, and that's not okay. Let's move on to Heather, because you uh, uncovered a different sort of scandal, and, and your in uncovering of the MPs' expenses scandal was, in fact, more data-led. But it, does it come down to the same sort of thing, the desire to hold the powerful to account? Um, well, this, I guess I, I wasn't sort of going for any, what was unusual about the way I did it, I wasn't going for any particular um, MP. I was more taking on an institution, and um, that's really what I, what I wanted to take on. And in my investigations, I do generally tend to focus towards the more, um, I guess, sort of centers of power, and they tend to be predominantly male. Um, Led and um, most of the people in them are. So uh, Parliament was definitely on my radar. The Parliament and the police were the two places that I spent the majority of my time mm -hmm. investigating. And um, Parliament um, was at that time very heavily you know, made up of men, not just as the MPs, but the administrators who run the actual House of Commons. 
Um, so it was a sort of right honorable gentleman, and the whole MP's expense scandal really was uh, based around this, um, it was a gentleman, it was like the ultimate gentleman's club. I mean, most of the people there were considered like these right honorable gentlemen. They didn't require uh, receipts for any expense up to 250 pounds until this all hit. Um, and basically they were pretty able to write their own Checks so you reckon that they too were acting from a position of entitlement and that this was yeah definitely fundamental and the people that um, I mean when when it all blew blew open it wasn't only men who were shown to be behaving badly women were equally you know able to behave badly as well when it mm. came to, to how they spent the public's money but I would say that um, the way the system was was built and created it was this very much uh, sort of male bastion of secrecy. Secrecy was quite a, a key element to how this whole system operated. And it was in this sort of, uh, I would say, I wouldn't even call it collegiate. There was something more than that. It was uh, it was a sort of, I guess, idea of a gentleman's club where it's, it's we're all like-minded people together mm. and we all look out for one another. And they did try to head you off at first, didn't they? Because you had to Not try several times. Not at first. I mean, it was like a five-year investigation, so it went on for quite a long time. They headed you off for a long time. <laughs> yeah. But you, um, you didn't give up. So ex can you tell us about how that happened, how you finally got through and got the information or some information that you could use? Yeah, well, so I also operated from, from a tip-off, um, and it was another reporter, actually, who tried to get so far um, with uh, looking at expenses. And so I just sort of re more relentlessly uh, carried on making these freedom of information requests for the information. Because they wouldn't let you have um, the, the whole of the MP's expenses. You no. had to sort of refine it and refine it and refine no. it, but you couldn't ask for one either. No, and, it, and it, it, the base, basically, to summarize five years, it, it ended up in the the High Court as a, as a case of me and two other journalists against uh, Parliament, which we amazingly won. And um, all that information should have been revealed, but then, yeah, again, the sort of reactionary defense to this sort of call for reform wasn't to reform in line with people. Like, society definitely had changed expectations, as I think you see with, you know, the President's Club. And the people in power just either didn't have a clue about this different expectation mm -hmm. of behavior that they should have been uh, you know, acting upon, or they just didn't want to know and they buried their head in the sand. But the end result was that they uh, tried everything they could to avoid giving out this information, which then created a sort of black market for it. And that's what sort of led one of the insiders inside parliament to make an illicit, a copy of the whole disc. When you say black market, you didn't pay for this. I didn't personally pay for it, no. I did all my stuff through, mm -hmm. le movement. through legitimate, sort of, through the courts. Um, I was still new to British journalism then, so I wasn't uh, aware that it was based on money changing hands as much as it was in, mm -hmm. at that time. At that time. Um, and so it was actually bought by the Telegraph, mm -hmm. the disc. So, um, so they uh, then had the whole, the whole data set and um, published it. Well, Chris, if we come to you, when we talk about the mechanics of scandal, when does something go from being a sort of collective gasp of, uh, to being actually a scandal? And the, what Heather talked about, this changing what the public expects and what the public wants changes at certain times. Is there some sort of tipping point when something that perhaps people think is a bit disgusting or don't even want to know about suddenly becomes something that they're, they're prepared to be horrified at and do something about? Is that when it becomes a scandal? I think that last question is really interesting because I still there are still things that we'll talk about later that society doesn't want to know about that we probably should be having scandals around that we're not. There are probably some things that we should be having a scandal about which we're not. Um, the scope for our scandal, I'm interested in how scandals break and how they activate and how they unfold and how they amplify and how society um, and the news media, society through social media and news media are working to break down the structures of secrecy and concealment and discrediting and denial that have allowed the institution to be powerful in certain institutions, try to think of an institution in Britain that has not recently been mired in scandal, to um, do bad things, sometimes for decades in secrecy uh, and with impunity. And I have a model, which I'll go through very quickly, if it's useful to do so, about how scandals work. This is how scandals work in the digital age. So scandal, there, there, there is a proliferation of scandal, um, whether it's MP's expenses or FIFA or Volkswagen or Savile, which is the one I've written most about, or Weinstein, which I'm here to talk about tonight. There is a proliferation of scandal in the news. Um, and there are all sorts of interesting reasons for that, but they all start with rumor and gossip and hearsay, 
All scandals begin with whispers, without exception. And most scandals don't break because they stay whispers. Something needs to happen, there needs to be a tipping point to get it from the point of rumour and gossip and hearsay into a full-blown scandal. They lack news media validation. We can talk about corporate news media, professional news media. But if you look at the timelines for the Weinstein scandal, of which there are now many online, they all start at the same place. They all start with the day the New York Times published the article. Right Now, Weinstein has been doing what Weinstein's been doing for decades. It only became the Weinstein scandal whenever the New York Times published it. The expenses scandal, the President's Club, I don't know if it's a scandal, but you know, that, 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 that event, whenever people and professional journalists went, right, this is an event. Then there has to be a reaction. The reaction, public fascination and moral outrage. Right? Our appetite for scandal appears to be insatiable. And I would stress that you know, a scandal for the Sun and a scandal for the Daily Mail and a scandal for the Guardian and a scandal for the Times might not be the same scandal, but everybody's interested in scandal. Um, the accused, confession and apology, unlikely. Defiance, as in the case of Max Mosley. Um, denial, usually the case. But because journalists have fact-checked, usually, um, or done lengthy investigations themselves, by the time this is published or broadcast, the assumption is that there's a fairly good chance this person is guilty. So the position that's adopted tends to be guilty until proven innocent, which is a direct inversion, of course, of due process. Um, if that is going to get bigger, there's going to be a shift towards institutional cultures of impunity. Then the attention is, well, how did this person get away with this for so long? They were surrounded by powerful folk who protected them, who paid people off. They had a coterie of lawyers. There were non-disclosure agreements. There were threats. You know, Weinstein and Savile are very similar in this respect. And then there is the justice phase. The justice phase I find particularly interesting because we have all sorts of different forms of competing justice. We've got formal due process and criminal justice. We've got institutional justice. And we've got this very interesting thing, media justice. What, the media. court of public opinion? The court of public opinion, exactly that. But it's sometimes said in a, well, the court of public opinion. It is fantastically powerful. Fantastically powerful. But the Weinstein case is different, isn't it, from, say, the President's Club, where it's collective, collective guys, and, yeah. and Parliament, the Gentlemen's Club, where it's groups. Is this Weinstein, and to some extent, Savile, or one individual? Is there a difference between a scandal which is created around one individual and a scandal that's created as the result of, in the end, public outrage about the way a, usually an entitled group behave? Yeah, I mean, there can be, but Savile went from being the Savile scandal to something else. It's incredibly quick. It was incredibly quick how much, how, how quickly Savile disappeared from that and it became a scandal about the BBC. And then it became a scandal about the health sector. And Kate Lampard did 42 independent inquiries into hospitals in the UK. And then it was the education sector. And then it was the Crown Prosecution Service. And so on and so on and so on. And now we have the biggest public inquiry in British history. With its fourth chair, I think, because the first three were effectively, you know, um, resigned or put under a lot of pressure. So that became an institutional scandal incredibly quickly from the actions of an individual to the cultures which protected that individual to the wider systemic problems of the abuse of <coughs> women and children across and British society. And with Weinstein, what we're really seeing is it's very centred on one person. This seems to me to be a scandal that hasn't spread to other individuals to the same extent. Not yet, although the, the, the New Yorker ran an article, I think, of about 120 people mm -hmm. who've been named since Weinstein. And there have been interviews about you know, Weinstein, Savile, there, there are clear similarities. So it only started in October. It's relatively young in scandal terms. I would not be at all surprised if it spreads and amplifies and becomes institution going forwards. We, we this will see. The, the other obvious question, which is, is why now? These things, there are always scandals, but there are a proliferation of scandals, particularly to do with women feeling abused. And that's happened in the last, what, six months? Mm -hmm. Since October. October for Weinstein and then January for the President's Club. Mm. Do you think that there's something to do with a now, a moment? Why is this taking off right now? I'm, I mean, it is, it's, it's a really interesting research question, why now? But I think it takes back a bit further than that. Savile was some kind of a turning point, surely. Because Savile was about women, young women, and children. 
And this is the same then, there was Cosby, and then there's Weinstein. And I guess one of the differences with the past was scandals used to be isolated and reasonably discreet. And now they're networked and interconnected. So a scandal here can have ripple effects, what generate another scandal there and another scandal over there. And they used to be, you know, closed off. A scandal would end, arguably today now, because of social media. You know, the digital imprint is eternal. They can keep rolling and rolling and rolling. Could I come back to, to Madison here? Because I can imagine a situation when I was in journalism, say, 20 years ago, you'd know that this sort of thing went on, but you just wouldn't take it on. You wouldn't consider necessarily it would even be a story because that's how people like that behave. You got the tip. What made your journalistic antennae twitch? What made you think that this is a story, not just you know, one of those things that goes on? Um, initially, I didn't know it was a story, and I, I discussed it with a, another journalist who said, I'm not sure it is a story. Um, uh, yeah. That's, could you, could you imagine? <laughs> like, I find that really, really interesting. So, because I think probably in the past the reaction would have been, well, it's not really a story, you know, it happens. What's the problem? These girls know what they're doing, you know, and they're getting paid. Just to say, I had exactly the same encounter with MPs' expenses. I can't tell you how many journalists told me that was not a story before it became a big story. And what were their grounds for saying that? Well, I had Jen Humphreys on the Today program say, oh, we all, we all abuse our expenses. And I'm like, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> It's good to know. <laughs> so, so what? Um, I, I, think, I, don't think, I think that was um, just ignorance. They, they didn't know enough about it, and neither did I. So I, I had to start doing the research. Um, and there had, I think this kind of speaks to the point that you're making, there had been a small number of press articles written about this event over the last decades. I, I found four, there's, you know, something in The Independent, something in The Guardian, kind of short little snippets, um, which were quite jokey along the lines of like, ha, 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 the wives were left at home last night while the men went out to play um, and then tucked into the hostesses. Um, and so it was known about, but it hadn't dawned on anyone that actually this whole event might not be okay. So something's definitely shifted in the kind of social narrative um, about, uh, yeah, yeah, which was quite obvious, I think, from my perspective. What was it that made this such a, a story this year? I think year? this is, it's, I, I've got a friend who's actually made this point. It, Every single person I've spoken to about this story, they are all, they all have a completely different, the thing is, um, which makes it so shocking to them, from the fact that the women were kind of forced to sign NDAs on arrival, to the fact that they were told what color underwear to wear, to the fact that it was a male-only event, to the fact that uh, kind of, you know, as one MP referred to it as being a, a lady zoo, that, you know, the groping was rife, to the fact that it had been going on for 33 years and nobody had, you know, touched it with a barge pole. There, there were so many, it was like the perfect storm of shocking facts. I think that's... The I think. story was something for everyone, really. <laughs> a very big story indeed. But what about the fact that there is now, particularly, say, if we go back to Weinstein and Me Too, the sense, in some areas, of, of a backlash against it. I was thinking of articles in The Spectator, say, in the week, ending March the... or starting March the 5th, there were two articles there saying, you know, this has been hijacked by celebrities, this is not a grassroots movement. And you see it all over the place. These are women who are using this for, you know, they... they did what they wanted to do to get on with their careers. That's what Weinstein's lawyer says. Um, and therefore, why is it such an outrage? Is there a sense of a backlash, do you think? I mean, Chris, when you look at the development of scandals, is there somewhere in the, in the scandal a backlash? Perhaps not in the Savile situation, because it was so uh, cut and dried. But generally speaking, do you get a backlash in a scandal? I mean, you, you, you can. It depends on the zeitgeist. And there's clearly a zeitgeist here for, you know, for this kind of thing to be exposed. There, there, there is a backlash. Has it been hijacked by celebrities? If celebrities are speaking for publicity, that's what celebrities do. It doesn't mean what they're saying is untrue. Um, the Me Too campaign is kind of focused in the workplace, um, and it's raising a huge amount of attention to harassment and abuse in the workplace. There are an awful lot of blind spots that we don't look because you know, the vast majority of abuse happens in the home and we're just not ready to go there and look at that, are we? And, you know, so we have scandals in places where we're prepared to look. Our preparedness to look in the workplace has increased now because there's an appetite. One scandal is feeling off the next. People can see that. Um, the public exposure of people doing these things can have outcomes. And I think also, you know, it, it's kind of representing a collapse of faith and formal due process, which is ongoing. But again, with there's, no there's no chance of formal justice for a lot of this, formal due process. So what else is there? Then that justifies perhaps what you could call the collateral damage. There's evidence that some of the people who are accused in these scandals 
are not necessarily guilty of anything or, you know, went along with it for other reasons. Or there, are, there are other people who were, say, involved in the President's Club who seem to have emerged from it squeaky clean, like David Walliams, for example. You don't hear him associated with the, uh, the, the dreadful things that happened, and yet he was the, the host on the evening. So what I'm getting at is to what extent does scandal somehow not stick to some areas and stick to other areas? A, a, if you say that people need the court of public opinion in order to get redress, it's deeply unfair, isn't it? Because it doesn't stick in some areas and it does in others. Yeah. But I think that's because you can't, you can't predict it. I mean, we're talking about what, at moments when cultural values shift. And I imagine if the President's Club investigation was done even like a year ago, it would have had a, a different reaction. <laughs> And n nobody can quite predict, you know, it's, it is a kind of thing of the zeitgeist. I, I, I know with the MP's expenses, you know, it was not a story for quite a while. And just different little things sort of kicked off at the right time. Like Derek Conway was found to have been employing two of his, he was an MP, employing two of his sons who were full-time students um, on the public payroll. And it hit just at a time when we also were introduced to austerity measures. And so everybody was told to tighten your belt. And then you see all this largesse come out. And with, with sexism, I think it's really, you've just had this sort of rolling uh, exposure of stories that really illuminate the full cost of, uh, you know, patriarchal society on women and children with the Savile um, scandal. And now you have a lot of women that have enough political power in politics and in newsrooms who can actually say, yes, these are stories that matter. We should be telling these stories. Um, and now we have enough students trained as journalists that can go off and report those things that matter to them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and certainly I feel like that's the, we keep looking at these scandals individually and not really seeing that it is really a broader cultural change, almost revolution really, where uh, we do see the full cost of you know, men, men behaving Chris, badly. And, and we also have a society that's willing to believe but Chris, in your program, you look at the Profumo scandal, which goes back yep. to the 1960s and was absolutely massive. Was there a shift in cultural values then that provoked that? Yeah, pe people were queuing around the street waiting for Lord Denning's report to come out. There were like <laughs> riots because of this inquiry report that was going to be published. Um, and that was about the sexual politics of the time, the gender politics of the time, that was about a transformation in society and it completely captured that Do you think that, that that's really what it was about? Or was it more about the, um, the ruling class and the trust in the ruling class and, and that the women in, there, in that scandal were actually almost incidental? It was, and it was also racialised. The initial reporting of it was intensely racialised and that fell away because of the character of Johnny Edgecombe and others who were in it. Um, and, and the horror was that um, Profumo was um, liaising with Christine Keeler, who was also liaising with Afro-Caribbean men. You know, and, and the, so there, was, there were all sorts of different elements to the scandal. What we remember today in terms of the caricature of Profumo, if you like, or its lasting legacy, mm -hmm. and the news reports at that time are not necessarily the same thing. There were lots of complexities at the time which have sort of fallen away. Mm -hmm. And of course, the fact that she was involved with the, the Russian um, attaché yeah. at the same time was the, the clear. And that's why the he eventually thing. went. There were a lot of uh, other things. I mean, I think a very difficult question to ask, but I feel I have to ask it, is the issue of the collateral damage of perhaps people who are hurt by this, who didn't necessarily do something wrong, who get accused or have been swept along by what they consider to be the values of the time. Does that matter? Or are they just going to be fed to the wolves because that's the way it goes? I mean, there must have been decent people at that dinner. Um. We, yeah. And what about the charities and all of this? We... No, the charity, the, well, I've got um, quite strong. On the charitable side of it, it's one of the things which we knew we would be criticised for. So um, the President's Club folded after our um, report came out. And um, I think this year it raised, well, at this year's event, it had raised £2 million for charity. Um, although a couple of the prizes later turned out to be uh, um, Ill illegitimate prizes. They weren't actually allowed to be given. But anyway. Um, <laughs> There's nothing stopping the people in that room from continuing to give large sums of money to charity. So I don't buy that argument. The other thing is the, uh, the charities that lined up say they're going to return the cash. They're now kind of stuck in this limbo where the charity's commission is saying, well, you might not be allowed to return the cash. So um, it's not as clear cut as charities have lost a load of money, in my opinion. And I also think you've got to think about the, you know, how that money is procured. And I don't think sexual harassment is a legitimate fundraising tool. 
And what about the men who were there who weren't <laughs> guilty of sexual harassment? Or were they guilty um, by implication? Were they guilty because uh, they went along? I think, I think it matters whether it was the first time they attended or not. Um, the, you know, one of the, head, uh, the funnier sides of doing the reporting is that on the day that we were publishing the article, you know, we must have put in 30, 40 calls to the people who were there that day. And suddenly everyone was abroad on holiday, sick. You know, literally they all went underground. Um, and then suddenly came out the string of excuses. You know, I, I arrived at 8, I left at 8.30, and you know, my eyesight was suffering that night. Um, <laughs> so, yes, there was some, you know, I... I, I that, the person I mentioned at the very beginning, he's an academic, and funnily enough, he was the only person in, who I came across that entire evening who was really, he didn't want to tell me his name, he didn't want to tell me his um, profession. Uh, you know, most of the men there were very keen to brag about what kind of things they did and how much money they had to spend that night, and he was the complete opposite. He even hid his name place um, so that I couldn't see his name, and, I, and he was the only one who did that. Um, later transpired, he's a vice chancellor of a university in the north of England. Um, and he's put out a statement on the record about all of this, so I'm not doing him a disservice by talking about it. Um, but yeah, he was genuinely shocked by what he was seeing. Mm. Interesting. But to talk about the sort of the collateral damage, the, the other people that get, get carried along in this, and we're trying to see both sides. In this particular environment, obviously, uh, we are, I think most people who are here would be very pro what happened, but it has been said, these girls knew what they were doing, they were paid for it, it's okay. I mean, this is said quite frequently in other, in other forums. Is there any credence to be given to that sort of attitude, Heather? No, in brief. I mean, I would, I would look more at, um, you know, when you say collateral damage, I mean, that implies that these poor innocent, you know, men who happened to go unknowingly to a men-only event where, you know, has a history of sort of having these sexualized hostesses wandering around um, selling prizes that are questionable. Um, I would more say, what about the ongoing damage that happens every day from these, in, these sort of traditions and institutions that uh, systematically abuse whole sections of society? And it takes a lot for, you know, for these things to be exposed, to be, uh, to be talked about. And when they are, obviously it upsets people because they, they believed the world was you know, good and people were you know, behaving well, and then they're shown that they're not. But what about the argument, which you do have to, I think, tackle, that the women who went along to the president's dinner knew what they were doing, they were getting paid for it? None, no. of, them, none of them had signed up to be sexually harassed that night. It's, it's, uh, I don't buy it. Yes, fine, they knew that they were going to be wearing a, a, a black dress. Um, I was told it would be mid-thigh, so, which was untrue. Um, and uh, you, got, you got given the, the dress when you got there? You had to hand in your mobile phone in order to get the uniform. So they <laughs> locked away your phone for the night, so you had no means of contacting the outside world. Um, uh, yeah, and nowhere on your, in the kind of uh, briefing email ahead of the event did it say, you know, by working at this event on a 10-hour shift for £150, do you agree to be touched up by the men present? But I also think it's like we give so much, all, all of that sort of saying collateral damage or it's always giving the benefit of the doubt to the abuser and not to the person who was abused. And so the women are having to always justify like, well, here's why, you know, they're, they're having to justify, you know, why, why were you in that situation? Why did you take that job? If you took it, you must have known it. And you saw the same stuff with Harvey Weinstein. You know, well, you must know what it's like to be an actress. You must know what's involved to get parts. Um, you must know if you went to his hotel room what was going to happen. It's like, no, actually you don't. And why, why do I even, as a woman, have to answer these questions? Why is he not being asked questions? You know, why is, why is all of the in interrogation sort of directed at the victim and not the perpetrator? And this plays into what you were saying, Chris, about there are a lot of scandals still to be uncovered. There's a, and you talked about the home and... Yeah, I mean, I'd like to say a little bit about this point as well, if I may, first. I mean, I, th I think it is a really, really important issue about so-called collateral damage, but also about evidence. Um, you know, the assumption in a court of law is that you're guilty until, or you're innocent until you're proven guilty. The burden of proof lies with the prosecution. It always has. The assumption in the Weinstein case is that he's guilty as charged, but he hasn't actually been charged with anything. And this is an uncomfortable issue. Um, and, you know, society needs to take a look at this. There are so many, but, you know, I don't think anybody questions that he's guilty of doing a lot of the things that he has been charged for. But that evidence hasn't been tested and it hasn't been proven. This is a volume situation where so many people are saying this with such detailed recollection that it must be true. But, okay, and, 
possibly, and, you know, and you know, we're not going to debate whether or not, because we can't debate whether or not it's true here. What I'm talking about is a shift in the nature of justice yeah, I would towards... Yeah, it's a lag of justice, isn't it? Like, it's a shift in the... And for, sorry, go on. for women to sort of bring these cases, and, and particularly sexual abuse cases, are so hard to take through the criminal justice system. There's so many barriers just to getting the evidence, um, their, whether the witnesses will be believed, the mm -hmm. way they're interrogated, and... I feel like there is some really systemic reform that has to happen in criminal justice, but it hasn't happened yet, and so that's why we sort of circumvent it by doing it all on Twitter and Instagram. So that is, but that, that in itself is an interesting shift. That is people saying, do you know what? I'm not going to get my day in court, probably, so I'm going to go to the meeting. Can I read you a quote from someone that I interviewed years ago? This, this is where my interest in this began. Um, and this was when I was doing my PhD research in the 1990s. Um, on Northern Ireland. I'm from Belfast, Northern Ireland, in case you hadn't guessed. Um, and she is called Jennifer in the book. She was a survivor of um, child sexual abuse. She was an adult when I interviewed her. She was a very active, incredibly courageous person, um, campaigner. Went through the court system, got absolutely nowhere. Went to the Sunday World, which was the Northern Ireland equivalent of the News of the World, um, back when the, there was a News of the World. And I was speaking to her, she was incredibly generous with her time, I spoke to her many, many times about trying to understand the representation of sex crime in the Northern Ireland press, basically in a context of conflict, war, and it was all sort of politicised. But there was a consensus, a moral consensus around child sexual abuse. And she explained to me why she went to the media. I'm going to read it verbatim. Um, she said, one of the great things that I think they do is they actually call them monsters and all sorts of horrible words. And I think that's great, because that's exactly what these people are. I had never thought about my uncle like that before. He wasn't a monster, he was my uncle. He wasn't a monster, he wasn't a fiend. And I hadn't felt any anger before then. I hadn't been able to feel any anger. And that was the first time I thought, yes, he is a fucking bastard, he is a fucking monster. And I felt vindicated by the fact that someone had actually acknowledged that what he had done to me was horrific. And I thought that was absolutely brilliant. And that was through okay. the press. She, she went through the press to that. Um, you know, who's going to argue with that? Okay, that was her catharsis, her public acknowledgement that something had happened to her and that it was horrific when she hadn't had a dang court. She went to the press as an absolutely last resort when everything else had failed. Are we looking at a situation now? whenever people are taking to the media as a first resort to literally circumvent due process because there's so little faith that something will happen. Do you know what? Let's just go online. What I think I'd like to do, or we should do, if everyone's happy, is break and take questions or comments from the audience now, then come back to the panel, then maybe take some more questions or comments if that's the mood of the room. So um, would anybody like to join in with this? Loads of people. Would you like to go first? What I'll do now is put these points to the panel and ask each member of the panel to come back fairly quickly on each point. So, to sum up, a couple of people at the beginning. Is the Me Too, um, the Me Too phenomenon a product of the, of the Trump election and a reaction to what's seen as um, a resurgence of um, conventionalism in the US? Do you want to start, Chris? There's a lot of collective anger. How that's being channeled through sexual harassment, I guess, is... <coughs> It's not a reaction um, to the, the Trump administration? Well, again, there's all sorts. People, people, some people in America are very angry because he's there. And this is one way of expressing it? They voted him in. It's one way of expressing it potentially. I think there's a lot of collective guilt about society's complicity in not speaking out about all sorts of issues for a generation. And I think that these are now falling one by one. And sexual harassment and child sex abuse and institutional corruption are all part of a much bigger picture. Okay, Heather? Um, yeah, so I was living in New York during the election and I think probably sort of the feminist consciousness was, was activated because we were on the verge. Everyone thought of having the first ever female president. And then, you know, you suddenly discovered instead you've got Donald Trump. Um, so it's clearly not. <laughs> um, so I think it was just that massive turnaround that's, you know, that you have, you've kind of activated all this feeling in a lot of the population and then suddenly they're faced with somebody who was exposed so is, as a sexual Is Weinstein harasser. a proxy for Trump? Is that 
I think it's I think it's just everybody is very alert in America and increasingly the rest of the world about uh, sexual politics, gender politics. What is uh, what is it to be a feminist? What is it to be mask to be a man? I mean, all of these questions seem to be um, it, it's it, it that election really sort of uh, hit a, hit a sort of zeitgeisty mm -hmm. moment that got everybody thinking about these issues. I'd like to think that a lot of this stuff would have ultimately been exposed regardless of who is in power in the US. So, I'm, yeah, I'm, Maybe, but I'm hedging my bets on that jury's one. Not, not <laughs> you. Uh, the other question that came up for, for you particularly was why didn't the other girls go to the police? Yes. Um, so I think, I think there are three really strong reasons for that, and actually it also applies to myself, because I was asked whether I wanted to go to the police after the event, and I said no. Um, so I think that we've already discussed it on the panel. I think reporting systems for that kind of behavior are, uh, they can be bleak. Um, they're stressful. The victims are, um, they have their own kind of uh, backgrounds and personalities scrutinized. Um, it, it's a really, really stressful process. I know, you know other women who've been um, victims of much more, um, of really nasty kind of sexual violence, and, and they didn't report it either. So I think there's a real issue there around reporting that kind of thing to that, the police. That really goes along with what Chris was saying about this is an alternative form of justice that we have um, emerging now. But the, and then the, the two other ones, I think they are worth raising is one, this is that a lot of these women, this is their regular livelihood. And actually that comes back to another question yeah. we had earlier on the um, collateral damage. So if you, if you complain about how you were treated at one of these events, are you then going to be um, kind of blacklisted from that industry you know, and viewed as a troublemaker. I think that's a serious risk. So um, I think legitimately a lot of women just kept quiet. Um, and the third reason is the, uh, the non-disclosure agreements. So the first thing I did on arrival at the Dorchester was I was kind of frog marched to a, uh, a long table where they had these piles of documents and you were told to sign it on arrival. Um, they were about, I, I can't remember, six or seven pages long. Um, you give no time to read the thing. Um, I had just enough time to catch the President's Club was on the front of it, so at least I knew who the contract was with. Um, and then you had to sign your name on the back. Um, so if you're and also we, we were told via email in advance, never, ever, ever discuss this event with anyone, including your boyfriends, which um, I've since raised. It's quite interesting. They all assume that we are straight women. But um, <laughs> yeah, just I don't know if those are good enough reasons, but um, to whoever asked the question, there was a the three, whole host three of them. reasons. Yeah, um, the, the court of public opinion, um, this whole idea that we are using social media, we are using the support, mutual support for women, to actually go and make this public and get some sort of redress that we wouldn't have had through the through the courts. But is this absolutely undermining our, you know, our decent? British justice system, Chris? Well, British justice system, the Metropolitan Police are investigating, I think, in, in, in Los Angeles and New York. Um, prosecutors are saying that the arrest of Weinstein is imminent. His um, attorneys are strenuously denying this. We will see. And yet, you know, as I said earlier, his, his, his status degradation is absolutely complete. Um, so there, there, there is a shift here. I, was, I went over to Australia last year to the University of Melbourne to talk about um, my research on scandal because there's a Royal Commission on Institutional Child Sexual Abuse there. And I watched the video um, that was produced by the Royal Commission and the Royal Commission is urging people to come forward saying, please come forward, you will be believed. Okay? Now it doesn't say you will be taken seriously and it doesn't say your evidence will be tested through a court of law, through due process, and it doesn't say you, know, you will not be disbelieved, it says you will be believed. And that is a shift, and that's a really significant shift, because implicit within that is you will be believed, and their assumption will be that the person you're saying did this did this. And in terms of your point about, you know, and there's a panorama that I watched around Weinstein. It's a series of talking heads. Weinstein did this, Weinstein did that. There's no critical engagement with this material or evidence at all. It's presented as fact. It's presented as true. Um, and that's a shift, and I'm not taking a strong normative position on this, but it is remarkable. Could the you shift actually argue that there's always been a court of public opinion, but that public opinion in the past tended to be pro the establishment? Yeah, and that, well, the decline in deference over the last three decades is absolute. You know, there, there are no sacred institutions left, none. I think that's a, uh, that is a really important shift. I don't know if that answers your question, but it's definitely something that's. Except possibly, except possibly the family, and we're not prepared to look at the family because it's too uncomfortable. But you think we should? Well, 
a hell of a lot of abuse happens in the family. The abuse that we read about in the newspapers, it's on the street, it's in the institutions, it's not at home. We're not ready for that yet. What about the next question, which was the, the ambiguous cases, people who get accused, um, um, if I'm interpreting what you say correctly, people who get accused and it's a confused situation and it becomes a scandal or a mini-scandal and perhaps it's unfair. Is that the point you were making? When I train people to do investigative reporting, um, it's always to have an open mind, but be skeptical when you hear people, a source, tell you a story. So it's never to be disbelieving, um, but nor is it to just you know, swallow everything they say wholesale. Um, but it's never to be discourteous or just kind of look like, who are you? Um, I don't believe anything you say. And I think in terms of uh, uh, you know, the rule of law, I think there's quite a lot of evidence to show that our criminal justice system isn't as you know, sort of judicial as, as, as might be made out here because you, we've got right now a, a, high, um, a judicial review going on with the John Warboy's uh, serial taxi rapist case in which the police, you know, a, a woman goes to the police with a clear cut, you know, complaint of a crime happening and the police just absolutely turf her out. Like they don't believe her, they don't take her seriously. And I, I am curious as an investigative journalist, how many times does that happen? Like I'd quite like to quantify what I sort of have a hypothesis is institutional sexism riven throughout our criminal justice system. And where, where people go expect, you know, hoping for justice, but because of their gender, or their age, they're not taken seriously, and their cases are not investigated properly. So I do think if that, it, it, it was quite similar to Parliament actually, there was a clear, clear failures of the system to deliver what they should have been delivering. And rather than reform, they just chose to kind of batten down the hatches. And I feel like this is a chance where or it's a similar time for the criminal justice system where its, its failures are exposed, particularly in terms of how it deals with women and children. And it either needs to reform quite dramatically or people will start to circumvent it. And that's really the danger where, you know, where we're at. So if, if it doesn't reform, that's creating like a, another societal danger that people will just not trust the courts, the police, prosecutors, They'll just think, we've got to do justice ourselves. Are we on the verge of that, Chris? I think we're there. I mean, the criminal justice system is in crisis. It's been in crisis for years, crisis for decades, and, and, and people are looking for alternative means. And it is a patriarchal system. It's an incredibly patriarchal system, and we know that as well. There's a huge amount of evidence. Heather's right. Um, the criminal justice system plays with this funny little concept sometimes called rehabilitation. There is no rehabilitation in the court of public opinion. It is purely retributive. And that is another very significant difference. Is that something that we have to accept happens in another form of collateral? Well, we're damage? driving it. Sorry? We're driving it. Um, I think we've answered most of the questions, and it, it's coming up oh, to time. May Sorry? I, yeah, there was one do. question about how do you get someone to care, which I kind oh, of right. wanted to uh, answer, um, which was that actually one of the few institutions that hasn't really been hit by this Me Too scandal is newspapers which are riven with misogyny and have been for quite a long time, especially in Britain. Um, not the FT, obviously. Um, <laughs> um, and, and if you were working in newspapers as a woman and you were doing stories about, you know, I guess, it, issues that affected women and children, part of your biggest battle wasn't about getting the audience to care, it was getting your editors to care, getting the backbench to care about where do they place these stories in the paper. And I know from your own work, Liz, it's like how do women get displayed in the news? Are they there you know, as like people of authority or are they like a woman in a bikini or a sex crime victim? Yeah, I was very intrigued with the, the outrage about the gender pay gap at the BBC in the newspapers. I would have loved to have known how much they paid their relative um, columnists because obviously the male columnists have a little bit more column inches sort of thing and a little bit more prominent and so on. So, yeah. you know, physician heal myself a little bit there, I think. I, you know, in a long and up and down career, have seen, you know, scandals come and go. But this is different. There is, a, to me, a tipping point here. I mean, as a, an older person, I do feel slightly ashamed of the fact that we haven't reached there sooner. But then perhaps my generation, to some extent, let this go and shouldn't have done so. It's a, it's a sort of personal creed de cœur. But this I, feels different to me. And the question I'd like to ask the panel and to end with is, how is this harnessed? What can we make out of this that's truly positive? Is this going to be another of those things which, you know, six months' time has just gone away? I feel that we may be able to use this, but how do we do it? So, um, 
I don't know who wants to go first on this. Is this just going to be something which burns out or is something really serious happening here? And are we, as women, part of this? Because we've actually said, me too. Believe me, 10 years ago, somebody like me would never, ever have said, well, I've been groped, because that would be an admission of weakness and you can't be weak. But now I'm prepared to say it, you know? And I think lots and lots of people feel that way. So are we on the verge of something very different? Or is this just another one that's going to go away? Stunned silence. <laughs> Chris, do you want to start on that one? You seem to feel that we're actually going somewhere with this. I think the changes that are happening now are very significant changes. Um, what comes of them? I mean, what, what outcome do we want? What does success look like? What does justice look like in this digital environment? Is it more people in court? Is it more people in prison? Is, Is it, it people being hung from lampposts? People being it's hung from lampposts. Well, you know, I mean... No, it's... Trial by media can be some form of public execution mm. in terms of shredding careers and reputations. That As is, you say, that it's all re retributive. continuing at pace, but it is purely retributive. Yeah. Heather? I, I sort of see where it's going. I feel like the next big conversation we're about to have is what is the nature of masculinity? What is manhood? What is it to be a strong man? What is it to be a weak man? I think men are in this like position where you know, loads of stuff. Which, well, women, we've had all these we've had these conversations mm. for a long time, um, and I'm, I'm not saying we're done. We're by yeah. no means done, but but it's it's pointless to just speak in a void. Like this is also about men and how do they define it to be a man? Like what made it acceptable for all those men at the Presidents Club to act the way they did, and to do so with sort of the the sort of uh, sanction of a whole society for so long? And so I feel like there's a lot of conversations that men need to have about. What, um, you know, what is it to be a good man, a strong man, a weak man? You know, I think of a weak man as Donald Trump. Like, he personifies to me a weak, you know, not a leader in any stretch of the imagination, not strong, uh, not, you know, I wouldn't ever admire him as a leader. But for a certain part, a big part of men, they think, oh, that's what it is to be a man, a strong man. But, Madison, do you want it to be about men, then? Yes. Um, I don't say it should be about men. I don't want you to. Say well, it did sound a bit like let's talk about men. Well, well no, yeah. but I feel like a lot of times, like this is a, this is a joint conversation, and men generally have like avoided having these conversations. Well, it's interesting. We had a lot of men ask the questions tonight. Anyway, Madison, you. Um, I, I think uh, on the President's Club story, I had so many male colleagues who were very proud of our reporting and were equally shocked and horrified. So I think. Um, yeah, I think, I think men are definitely part of this conversation. In terms of where we want to end up, my hope is that the kind of conversations we're having today around uh, equal pay for men and women, around sexual harassment, um, primarily of women, and that kind of thing, seem as bizarre to my, you know, the next generation as it did to, well, I've got colleagues who tell me now that when they first entered the workplace, they weren't allowed to wear trousers. So it was against company policy. That seems utterly ridiculous, and I can't believe it. I know it's a silly example, but... No, I it just, wasn't silly. It was horrible. We well, yeah, and it's not the, or the fact that, you know, they were the only woman routinely in rooms of hundreds of men at conferences and meetings, and I know that still goes on to an extent. I, ju I just hope all of this stuff seems kind of old-school, dinosaur, um, outdated, and unbelievable. So maybe we've reached that real tipping point and things will change. I'd be very regretful if there was anybody in the audience who was bursting to say something. We've got another two minutes if there is anybody, but we can draw it to a conclusion here at this point. Yeah, somebody there. It's just to reflect your comment about talking what men are. When we have the biggest killer of men in this country under the age of 45 is suicide, and the biggest killer of women under the age of 45 in this country is domestic violence, the common connection there is misogyny. So they're absolutely intrinsically linked. What are our ideas of men and women? So it's not about men taking forward the conversation. It's a shared responsibility in that conversation to say we are killing ourselves in this country from the same principle of attitudes. So misogyny has to be tackled. It has to be tackled by both genders and it has to be tackled now. Is that... A Absolutely. I'm sure that's something we could all agree with, and uh, I think that's a good place to end. So thank you very much, and thank you so much for your contribution. <laughs>